All right, guys, it is here. It is time. It is the new patch. It has all of the stuff that comes with uh, Lords of the West, the first DLC specifically for DE. And it has a bunch of other stuff beside. Now, I know a lot of you are like clambering to see stuff on the new civilizations. And don't worry, I will be going through the new civilizations, but that is going to be in a separate video that I'm going to upload like very, very shortly after this video goes live. I actually started recording the civs as well as like the, the patch notes and stuff, but it just ended up getting really long. And so I thought it might be good. Just split it into two videos. So literally probably within an hour or so of this video going live, uh, my specific thoughts on the new civs uh, will, uh, will be there. So this video is going to cover everything else in the patch because this is also a really big patch. And I will also show off the new maps really quickly. So all of that said, uh, let's get into this new patch. Join the New Year celebration to unlock exclusive new... Yeah, who cares? Uh, owners of Lords of the West will get access to the new uh, civs. Uh, lots of multiplayer performance and stability fixes. This is real big, guys. Uh, some profanity filter stuff. Now you can no longer use buildings to scout. Uh, so no longer we will have palisade scouting or farm scouting or whatever. This means that, so it used to be the case and was very important at high level play, where if you have an area scouted but is in the fog of war, you could scan uh, by trying to build a building, usually a farm or a palisade wall is there cheap and can cover area in the case of a farm. And if you couldn't build something there, then you knew the enemy had something there. And you could sort of scout without actually having to commit anything to it. And there would be no way for your opponent to actually know that you saw what they were doing. So that's a really going to be a really important change at high levels. And it's definitely uh, pretty surprising coming in kind of out of nowhere. But I think it's going to be probably for the best. Uh, there are going to be five new maps that I will go over for you guys. So I'll just show those off in the game itself. Um, there's just some unofficial mod stuff that's getting disabled, so make sure you re-enable those. And there are lots of other AI and pathfinding improvements that are great. So yeah, like I said, guys, new civs, they're going to be in a video that's going to come out very soon, like within hopefully an hour of this video going live. But I did, uh, I guess, decide that it would be better to split up the videos up into two because I was starting recording the Burgundians and it was getting really, really long really fast. So we're going to be just splitting this off into two videos. So I'm just going to try and hit on uh, all the big important stuff in this video for you guys, but I'll li link the entire uh, list in the description for people who want to read everything in depth. So just to hit on some of the highlights for performance stuff, uh, they addressed a lot of stuff when it comes to uh, lag and stuff in late game, especially in team games. So hopefully that's going to you know work out well. Also, there was some lag sometimes for people when a player would age up, it would cause the game to like freeze for a second. So hopefully that's gone and some other small crashes and stuff like that. Uh, other minor stuff as well. Uh, in an interesting UI change, bonus stats granted to units via automatic upgrades are now displayed in the base unit stats. So, for instance, a scout that advances to the Feudal Age will now have 5 attack instead of 3 plus 2 attack. So functionally it's the same, it's just a different way of presenting the information, which I find a little weird and a little confusing, but maybe that's just me being old. But just, um, you know, keep note of that. Uh, the profanity filter now censors words like the words itself that are considered vulgar rather than the whole sentence. Now you will get a notification when your teammate researches human mercenaries, which is pretty nice. Some interesting gameplay changes. Gaia no longer shares the same player color as Seven, which is gray, uh, but it displays its own player color as white, which is distinct uh, and really interesting. And I'm kind of glad that's going to be the case because gray looked like Gaia and was a little confusing. But uh, yeah, it's interesting that we now technically have another color in the game. Uh, some small BR change, including new units or heroes, line of sight, and then added a hotkey for select all idle military units, which is nice. Uh, they also fixed the issue where uh, gunpowder units especially would be less accurate than they were supposed to be, so that's now fixed. Of course, you, can get, you guys can bet for plenty of campaign content coming up soon, but yes, indeed, they did update some civilizations in Joan of Arc, Barbarossa, Attila, and Bari. Uh, that will now be replacing Franks and mostly just Franks, actually, with uh, Burgundians and Sicilians, depending on uh, the scenario. Also, there was a bug in Blood on the Riverbank where the AI would use the Mima princess that you have to return to get the support of green. 
uh, they would use that to, to scout. Uh, it happened to me once, and it was pretty funny. So the princess would run, run around and scout and then run into a castle and die. And then green would become angry and attack you. So that's not been fixed. Balance changes, balance changes, balance changes, guys. There are balance changes, and there are some really big important ones. And that's one of the reasons I am splitting this up into two separate videos. So let's just dive right into this. I think you guys are going to be very interested in these changes. You might love them, you might hate them, but let's let's just get into it. So starting off on maps where each player begins with multiple town centers, like Budapest, uh, additional villagers or llamas granted to Chinese, Mayans, and Incas will only spawn from one town center as opposed to each of them. So say on Budapest, it used to be that Chinese would start with 12 villagers as opposed to the logical 9. So they would get six extra villagers instead of three because you have extra town centers. So that has now been changed and I, I think is definitely for the best because Chinese were just the best civ. Kind of like how they used to be just the best civ on Nomad. Uh, now I think it's a lot more egalitarian. So that's, that's good. Reduce the hit points of palisade walls and gates by 40% in Dark Age. Now this is obviously going to be a buff to Drushing to some extent, punishing people who are going for staying in Dark Age a long time. But I think it's most especially going to impact the dynamic between men at arms openings and players who are trying to uh, wall fast castle or drush wall fast castle. As men at arms are already really good at taking down buildings, and if you're still in the dark age, those men at arms are going to just tear through you, man. So you do need to make sure you get up to feudal age pretty quickly. Scouts, it could impact to some small degree as well, but that's probably less uh, noticeable. But definitely do be a little bit more careful with your walling in the dark age now, guys. Oh boy, this is a big one, especially after the most recent tournament results uh, with the Lord himself using Cav Archers to great effect. But right now, guys, Cav Archers, both regular and elite, reduce the attack animation duration from 1.3 to 1.5 and reduces the overall attack delay by 11.5%. So now the attack delay is a little bit less and it's going to make them a lot easier to micro. Now, I, I've had to say this for a long, 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 long time, but... Cav Archers were not actually nerfed from HD Voobly to DE. Yes, their frame delay was higher, but the game runs at more frames per second. So the it sort of balanced out. And so it, it the net result was mathematically the same. However, the animation did look slightly different. And because there's less lag overall these days, units with high frame delays were a lot more noticeable and it felt a lot clunkier to micro, which is why you had a lot of pros say that, oh, Cav Archers are bad. I mean, I'm not I'm not going to call out anyone in particular for saying that Cav Archers are bad to their own detriment, but uh, I think you guys get the idea. Um, so now Cav Archers, we're going to be seeing them a lot more now, just in general, I feel. So uh, get ready, you Hun and Mongol fans, even Turks, Magyars, even civs like Bulgarians can go for Cav Archers, and it's going to be something that you're not going to see all the time, but Cav Archers still have their strengths and weaknesses, but it's going to be something that we see more from civs, I think, that specialize in it, or at least have pretty good Cav Archer options. Uh, fixed an issue where heated shot would not affect secondary arrows from castles and towers. Good stuff. The following civs no longer have access to Treadmill Crane, Frank's Khmer Slavs. This is entirely targeted at DM. Yes, I know I researched these texts in 1v1 in regular RM games, and it is just overall a nerf to these civilizations, but it's going to be a very, very minor one and I really wouldn't worry too much about it, except if you are a DM player. Um, I'm sure all five of you really uh, appreciate this change, Kappa. Um, but yeah, otherwise I wouldn't worry about it too much. Bulgarians. Now this is one that I personally will claim credit for because as far as I know, I was the only one to point this out, uh, at least to the devs specifically. But it happened to be the case where dismounted Konix had more line of sight than mounted Konix, which doesn't really make much sense. Uh, and that's because that the units technically did have the same line of sight, but because dismounted Konix are infantry, they benefited from tracking, which does still exist in the game. It's just free and is researched for everybody instantly upon reaching Feudal Age. So dismounted Konix would actually have two more line of sight than mounted Konix, so they fixed that. That was a critical change. So glad they put that in there. Uh, honestly, it's not a big deal, but I just thought it was pretty funny, and because I can take credit for it. Huh. And here's... First of, uh, I think, the three big ones, guys. Burmese, Arambai. Increase the damage dealt by missed shots, so shots that miss their primary target. So you had, you know, your main target that you were attacking with your Arambai. It misses that target but hits something else. For everything else in the game, that missed attack deals 50% damage. For Arambai, though, that's now going to be 100%. And before you panic, 
Arambai reduced the attack from 1719 in non-elite elite to 1215. So your same attack in Castle Age as Iron Casting Knights, and in Imperial Age, same as a Paladin with Foraging. So attack way lower, but also a lot more consistent. Uh, also, they increased the attack rate for regular Arambai. Uh, that's going to be a nice little buff, but it's more like a unit. The unit's been redesigned. And this is, I think, really important because Arambai were both too strong and too inconsistent. And now the whole double castle Arambai play is going to be very heavily nerfed. Now, when fighting other units, it the, the unit's still going to be really, really strong. Like, you know, it's, it's supposed to be a good unit, right? But now it's going to be a lot worse against buildings specifically. Because with Arambai, their low accuracy didn't matter when you're attacking a huge building, so you just nuke buildings super easily, and then Arambai would just kill everything. Now, it's going to be a lot harder to tear through buildings, although they're still not going to be awful against them. And when facing Arambai, now you really need to make sure that you are in staggered formation, otherwise you're going to get hit by all of that mist dart stuff. And so you're going to need to be careful about that. But overall, I'm really interested to how this redesign, you know, gets into effect, and I think it will go a long way to make Burmese a much more balanced civilization. I just realized that I was on technically the wrong scene, so the, the box where you see the stuff is a bit smaller, so apologies for that, but it's okay. Um, we'll just continue right along, and hopefully you can see a bit better now. Uh, but Franks, everyone who was clambering for a Franks nerf, you got your nerf. Franks uh, reduced the work rate of foragers from plus 25% to plus 15%. Now, this isn't a huge nerf, but I think it's a good one. I know I said a little while ago that I don't think Franks need any changes, and they really don't need anything super pressing. I think in 1v1s they were fine. I know that their stats win rate were really high, but I think that speaks more to the fact that Franks are both popular and easy to play, rather than that they were super OP. I think the problem actually came in team games, where when you're looking for a Paladin Civ, Franks were just, I think, too easily picked. Like, I think civs like Persians, Lithuanians, um, Huns, all should be comparable to Franks. And it seemed like Franks were just being picked a little bit more often than everyone else. So I think that this little nerf to their early game, not going to be too big, but I think it's just a, a nice little tap to their power. Huns! Atheism no longer reduces the cost of spies or treason, but now reduces the enemy gold income from relics by 50%. Now, before you all panic and say, oh no, my relics are useless now, remember that atheism costs 500 gold. So the actual savings are either going to be very minimal or and or take a very long time to pay off. So it's still kind of a meme tech, but it just means it's not completely worthless and is now just really, really situational on a map like Graveyard or something where it has a bunch of relics. So really, it's not that big of a deal. It just goes from useless to mostly useless. Italians, you guys are probably going to like the, uh, these ones. Reduce the price reduction from doc tax from minus 50% to minus 33%. So instead of being half cost, they now only uh, cost two thirds as much. So to compensate, the Civ also now gets that same discount applied to university tax. And Italians have every university tech except for siege engineers. So that means ballistics is 33% cheaper and chemistry is 33% cheaper. And of course, masonry is 33% cheaper, uh, most important of all. So I like this change. It makes Italians a bit stronger on land maps, gives them a, their archer identity, I think, a little bit more of a nod, especially since ballistics and chemistry are both so, so important and a little on the expensive side for the ages you get them in. Uh, and also to, uh, tunes them down a little bit on uh, water, where I think they were just a little bit too good. And I think a very slight nerf to them on water is exactly what you need, because if you nerf them more than this, I think they just, you don't really see them played too often. And now I think there's going to be real contention between like Italians, Japanese, Byzantines, Koreans, Portuguese, all those guys. So I think that's good. Also, they made Genoese crossbowmen a little bit cheaper on the gold cost. They used to be 45 wood and gold. Now they're 45 wood and 40 gold, so five gold cheaper. Um, just makes getting into Genoese Crossbowmen a little bit easier. They're a super strong unit, but took a while to get up and running. So that's definitely um, nice. It's just a nice little uh, buff. Koreans. This is, again, one that I know I can take credit for, because I know I addressed this to the devs specifically. So I'm glad to see 
Koreans can now get Elite Cannon Galleon. Uh, they used to be one of the only water sieve that didn't have Elite Cannon Galleon, and that felt kind of weird, especially since Koreans had like all the other gunpowder stuff and even have turtle ships, which are gunpowder ships. The more important reason is because in Korean mirrors on water maps, uh, it became very often impossible for anyone to win because regular Cannon Galleons don't outrange Korean towers, which also have heated shot. So it meant that you needed exactly trebuchets to take down Korean towers in a Korean mirror. And if you're on like a water map, then like that was just really hard and just get into so many stalemate situations. I know it's not a mirror matchup you see all that often, but it's like when it does happen, it's really unfun. So I think nice little boost and uh, I'm glad that they were able to, to get this one in there. And these next two guys, they're going to be big. Mayans, Obsidian Arrows, gone. Just gone from the game. Rip, Obsidian Arrows. Replaced by a new unique tech, Hulche, Javelin Ears. What does this do? Skirmishers throw a second projectile. So they, if this works in the same way as a uh, double crossbow for Khmer, uh, it means that the second Javelin is going to be dealing half damage. Now, one, this means that Mayans do get bonuses to their foot archers, their skirmishers, and they have an archer unique unit, so that's kind of nice. They get that they get bonuses for all of the archer units they can make. And it just removes obsidian arrows, which I think is just really bad design, and I think it's good to just be gone. It's not something I wanted nerfed, it's just something I wanted gone. And now it's gone. But to compensate, you do have better skirmishers. So you do also a little bit better in skirm v skirm, skirm v hal, really skirm v anything. So that makes them a little bit better in situations where gold is low, but uh, yeah, I'm just glad Obsidian Arrows is gone. And they have a, a fun little uh, new unique tech, and we'll see how good it is. In a similar vein, guys, Saracens. Archers no longer gain attack bonus versus buildings. Their team bonus has been increased from plus one to plus two, so it's going to be a little bit better than it was in Age of Conquerors. But other than that, they no longer get any specific Civ bonus for anti-building archers. Amazing. I think it's bad design, just like Obsidian Arrows, and I'm just glad it's gone. And it's going to be replaced by something that I'm also really happy with, and that is Camel Units now get plus 10 HP. Now, Zealotry has been both reduced in effect and cost, so Zealotry now 500 food, 450 gold, and now only grants plus 20 HP. So really, you're getting the same effect in post-imp, but you're front-loading some of the effect of Zealotry into the mid-game, which I think is really important because Saracens, as like a Camel Civ, like the original Camel Civ, had no really standout features to their Camels until you researched Zealotry. And now it makes mid-game Saracen Camels a lot more scary. Uh, also, it buffs Mamelukes a little bit as well, and I think this is just a great change all around. Encourages more camel play with a camel sieve. Who would have thought? And again, I'm just glad that that archer bonus versus buildings is now gone forever. Good, good, good stuff all around. I think Saracens are just, again, a more balanced sieve overall. Lastly, when it comes to balance changes, we have Tatars. Uh, perfect nerfs, in my opinion. Additional town centers uh, only spawn sheep starting in the Castle Age. And it's only additional town centers. So if you're confused by this, it used to be that you get two sheep when you hit Feudal Age. And then each town center from there on would have two sheep. Now you no longer get the two sheep from your starting town center. And you need to be in Castle Age to get additional sheep from newly constructed town centers. So it uh, doesn't affect you on Nomad or anything like that. I think this is perfect. You just get rid of the, the two sheep you get in Feudal Age because they already have longer lasting sheep. So it's just like delaying them from having to build farms for way too long. But now in Castle Age, you still get your two sheep. You still have a very strong boom. You can still delay farms in mid game, but it kind of spreads out the strength of the bonus a little bit more as opposed to just being super heavy in like feud mid to late Feudal Age, early Castle Age. Now it's just a bit more spread out. Also, Keshigs nerfed slightly. Uh, used to cost 50 food, 40 gold. Now they cost 60 food, 40 gold. So 10 more food per Keshik. Unit's still insane, don't worry, guys. But it's just going to require a little bit of a stronger food eco uh, to feel large numbers of them. So great changes to Totters. And overall, these, I think, are some really well like done balance changes. I agree with at least most of them. And I think especially the Arambai change, Italian change, and then Mayans and Saracens are all stuff that really makes the game more balanced and more fun to play because that sort of thing was just so unfun to go up against. So that's really great to see. Random maps, I will be getting into those in just a second. I'll actually just show them to you guys. And there were also some map balance changes. Um, I guess some highlights of this from what I saw. 
uh, arena. Now you, all your sheep will spawn inside your wall, so you don't have to worry about laming. And uh, Team Island's also got a bunch of uh, overhauls and stuff like that, so now the map should be a lot more balanced. Those are really the big ones. Some pathfinding improvements. Units will now prioritize the most direct path when moving less than 20 tiles. I don't know why this wasn't always the th case, but I'm glad it is now. Uh, there was an issue where boars would come uh, sometimes break aggro. Note that aggro is misspelled here. Lull. Um, so that used to be an issue. Now it's no longer one, apparently. And there was an issue where patrolling melee units would occasionally fail to engage in an and attack ranged units who were already in motion. Now, I did run into this bug several times, and I'm really glad that it has been addressed. Uh, and finally, ongoing investigation, uh, late game age up hitching. So apparently those are still issues in late game. Uh, some crashes. Uh, tech tree displays incorrect hit points. Um, it, they currently display the incorrect hit points for units. Uh, so that is now going to be fixed in the future. I, I end up going over this in uh, my video, so that's that's it's pretty funny right now, but that's still going to be fixed. And those are all the big ones. Like I said, I'll link in the description uh, all of the, the changes. And lastly, for this video, I will now show you guys the new maps. All right, so I'm going to show you guys the new maps real quick. Um, there are five of them, and some of them are just kind of remakes. I think most of them are actually remakes of existing maps, but still will show you them. I don't know why I'm on Portuguese have to go random. All right, guys, here is African Clearing. If you're like, wait a minute, isn't this Bedouins? It is Bedouins. It's it's almost exactly Bedouins, except the shorefish little ponds are a lot smaller and more sparsely spread out. And it looks like there might be a little bit more hunt, but this is actually kind of weird. There's like a lot fewer ponds on the left, but regardless, it's essentially Bedouins, guys. Uh, so now we have that as a map in the map pool. Next up, we have Amazon Tunnel. So this not map I'm not as familiar with, but maybe it existed before. Uh, looks like you have some regular-ish looking golden stone, and it is like super mega BF. It's You're just kind of in like a box. You just kind of like have this random hilly area in between you and the enemy uh, where all the relics are. But yeah, this is going to be like very much fat slobby, like wall the front of your base and then no counterattacks possible. It's honestly just very similar to BF, except in team games, uh, everybody is in like one clearing. And so there's always that one sort of area that you and your opponents are fighting for. Whereas in BF, there's like multiple paths to get to the enemy. Next up is Atacama, a map that you might be familiar with from a bunch of tournaments and as recently as Red Bull. Uh, notably, in this particular version, you do not have the ponds at the edges. That was just a Red Bull thing. The classic version of the map is pretty much just like this. A bunch of trees and stuff in the middle, but everything else is a very sparse, open desert, so it's all about taking control of the middle of the map. Walling is almost impossible. All of your uh, cavalry aggression-y sort of civ is going to be excelling quite a bit. It's Atacama. Next up, we have Coastal Forest. So again, this is a map I'm not familiar with. Uh, it's kind of like coast to mountain a little bit, kind of like uh, that one young panda map where it was like Cape of Storms, Cape of Storms, kind of like that, but reversed. Uh, you start fairly close to your opponent. There's a big old forest in the middle. Uh, looks like uphill is like the center area, and then there's some water around the edges of the map. So kind of a weird one, but it's definitely going to be one that is very aggressive and still uh, determined much by uh, map control. Also seems like some extra gold in the south. And finally, we have Seize the Mountain. If you're thinking, wait a minute, isn't this just Seize the Hump? It's pretty much Seize the Hump. It's almost the exact same, at least as far as I can tell. So now we have Seize the Hump, a very, very aggro map. We saw it uh, as recently as NAC3, I think. If not NAC3, NAC2 for sure. I remember casting games at NAC on this map. So going to be lots and lots of aggro here. You just have these big old marshy land to the side and then this big old mountain in the middle with most of the resources. So that will round out all of the new maps. All right, guys, so that was the January 25th, 2021 patch. Lots of exciting stuff in addition to the new civilizations. Definitely do leave a like if you guys enjoyed. And I will link the video um, where I talk about the new civs in the description once that goes live. So definitely stay tuned for that and definitely see you guys next time.